start, um, just I want to give you a couple basic ideas about Chinese medicine. Um, one of the biggest things to understand is that in general, um, it's a holistic medicine. So if you know what that means, um, it's based, holistic means that we're taking into account, into consideration, the entire being. Um, your whole biography is, is important and relevant to who you are and how you got to where you are now. So um, there's a real sense of talking about things in, in relationships this organ in relationship with that organ and how they function together. Not so much, we of course learn what they do individually, but there's much less emphasis on like the parts, which Western medicine typically emphasizes like a single part or a single, single organ or a single cause. They're always looking for what's the one cause, where as in this field, very rarely is there only one cause. Um, there's usually a multitude of causes. Um, so it's a holistic medicine, and we typically are looking for what are called patterns. So we look for patterns of disharmony when, when there's an illness. This is something that's similar in both um, Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. They look for these, what they, they call to create the pattern. We never um, treat an entity of disease, we treat a pattern. So this can include everything that's going on in the body at once. There can be maybe one or two patterns. For instance, an example that maybe is easy to understand is qi deficiency. If you've heard of the word qi, this is a word that's used a lot in Chinese medicine to talk about our body's energy. That's a simple way to say it. It's a very complex concept, actually. Um, qi has over 200 definitions that you could keep going, like life force, vitality, um, and Ayurvedic medicine, they talk about prana, so it's very linked to the breath. Um, like in yoga, that's what they're talking about, is moving the chi, moving the prana. Um, so chi deficiency is a very common pattern that we would, as a diagnosis. So someone could have just very general chi deficiency, and then we would, the treatment would then be to strengthen the chi or boost the chi. Um, but then there could be a secondary pattern. There could be um, like a heat obstruction or blood stagnation. There could be, it could be specific into an, an organ, like yin deficiency in the liver. So let's talk about yin and yang for a minute. I'm going to just use this <laughs> quick way to clear this board. Um, are you all familiar with the terms yin and yang? No? Let's, let's just define these terms because these are the basic underlying fundamental backbone of Chinese medicine, this theory. And if you understand yin and yang, which is very profound, very complex, and we could spend a long time talking about it, but we'll just um, go over a couple things about it because it is so um, it is so fundamental that even if you get totally lost in this, it's very complicated condition, um, you can go back to yin and yang and really kind of find your way through if it's, if it's complicated. So yin and yang is basically a theory theoretical way of describing phenomena. And it can describe, it's used to talk about all phenomena, including na natural phenomena as well as physical bodily phenomena. So body and nature. Um, and it's, it's totally relative, meaning it's when we talk about something being yin, it's not fixed as being a yin, as something that's yin. It's only relative to yang. So that Let's give an example to make that make more sense. One of the cl classic example of yin is cold. And then on the other side would be hot. So you can see how these are relative terms, right? For one person, something could be considered cold. For another person, that's more warm. Probably someone wouldn't say it's hot, but you never know. <laughs> um, but they're relative. And they're not fixed. They're not fixed states of being. They're constantly changing. So yin and yang, it's really important to understand that, that they're never, they're never fixed, they're never static. Come on in. Hi, sorry. We just started, you're fine. We're just talking about yin and yang, which I think you've been here for that before, so. I am a groupie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so relative to each other and constantly changing. So let's, let's just define some more things. Basically, everything that you could think of, we could put into, we could categorize as either yin or yang. But we're going to just pick some big, big ones that are relevant for health. So cold and hot are very relevant for health, actually. 
Um, anybody want to guess something else that could fall in one of the two categories? Dampness. Dampness? Or heat. Yeah, let's say wet. Okay. Wet and dry. So yin and yang, you're probably familiar with the symbol, right? You've seen that symbol before? Like this, where there's a seed of each in, in the other. So on one side, it's mostly dark, but there's this little bit of, of light. And then, and then on this side, it's mostly light, but a little bit of dark. So this symbol really says a lot. For one thing, it's a circle, it's a whole. They're totally united. Um, you can't separate them. And there's always a, a, a seed of the other in the other, so um, so maybe this can give you a hint of something else. I kind of said it already just by the drawing. Light and dark. Okay. Yeah. Dark is yin, yang is light. So I'm, I'll just kind of keep going with some of the terms that are more um, applicable to, to health. So yin would be inward. Or you could even say deep. Yang is outward, or more like superficial or exterior. So that's a, maybe even interior, exterior, better words. Heavy is yin. And then light, but light as in, you know, not very dense. Um, could say really gross is yin, subtle is yang, running out of room. I'll squeeze in a couple more. Earth is yin, and I guess we could say, they'll say heavens is how they talk about it in, in the literature, but you could also say sky or, you know, this idea of upward, upward and outward is yang. Inward and downward is yin. Uh, another good word to understand or that's applicable is contracted or contracting as a movement. That's a yin movement. And expansive is yang. Was that starting to paint a picture of understanding a little bit of what those terms are then? Is there a different picture for yang? Or is it? You mean the symbol? Yeah. This is yin and yang oh, together. together. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, so this side is the yang side, the light side, right, with okay. a seed of yin in it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. So, and one other, I'm just making sure I got all the words I wanted to share with you. Another good one is passive and active over here. Kind of related to that is slow, fast, and clinically, um, typically yin is more chronic. If we, if you, if there's a, something that's affecting the yin of the body, which is the deepest part of the body, that means it's taken some time to get there. So typically, it's more chronic. Whereas if it's more on the exterior or surface of the body, it's not. It's probably more recent. So more acute conditions typically are young. In general, it's much easier to treat yang than it is to treat yin. It's much easier to clear heat. Oh, one more word here, excess, is usually typically more associated with yang, whereas deficiency is more associated with yin. Not 100%. It can, there can be an excess of yin, which you used the word dampness earlier. Dampness is a pathological accumulation of fluid, so that's a, that's a yin substance, dampness, and that would be an excess condition. So yin can be excess, but it's more common for yang to be excess. So in general, it's easier to treat the yang because it's easier to knock something over than it is to build it up, right? Very similar in the body. It's much easier to clear something out than it is to create something new. It can do it, and it's actually one of the strength, the strengths of Chinese medicine and herbal, well, herbal medicine in general is that there's this whole class of herbs that 
are used to build, to rebuild. To, they're called tonics. And uh, that's something totally missing in Western medicine. They don't have anything like that. Um, another other class of herbs that's totally missing from the Western pharmaceutical um, offerings are detoxification herbs. Another huge thing that, that Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, herbal medicine in general, has many, many herbs that are used to cleanse, to clear the body, and then to strengthen and build up. So again, we're talking about yin and yang with, with that, you know, building the yin and yang or clearing if there's an accumulation. So that's just real basic yin and yang. We don't have enough time to go into it a whole lot more because we have a lot to, to go into tonight. So any questions though about it? Just an example of a tonic. Oh, ginseng? Oh, okay. Yeah. But in, in Ashwagandha, there's many. So it's not necessarily a liquid. No, no, it doesn't have to be a look. It just means there's a plant that has a tonifying action. So it means tonify is to strengthen or to build or to kind of boost. So that's yin and yang. And definitely Chinese medicine is based on all of this idea of understanding. We look at something and we start to first understand it by categorizing it a little bit. Is it more of a yin thing, more of a yang thing? And this is how we can understand which one it is. All right. Good if we keep moving. All right, I'm going to clear this off. Why do you clear them in? Uh, ashwagandha oh. is good for. Oh, yeah. I read. Um, it's it's good. I mean, basically, it's a chi tonic, just like ginseng. Ginseng is a little bit also of a yang tonic, so it's good for building like warmth, which is why sometimes people associate ginseng with like um, libido. I'll take ginseng to help strengthen libido. It's, it's, so it's got a little bit more of a warming action than ashwagandha does. Ashwagandha is more neutral, which is why, in a way, it's kind of safer to use than ginseng. And I wouldn't recommend for ginseng for everybody, you know. Whereas ashwagandha, ashwagandha is pretty use. safe for a lot of people to use that. But it's used for what? Any kind of deficiency. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. So that's yin and yang. And we talked a little bit about, in general, we're looking for patterns, right? So. In order to, once we kind of get an idea of a pattern, we start to look at, well, what's causing that pattern? So that's what we're talking about tonight, are the primary causes. So in general, there are, well, I'll say this first. The, the primary cause, which is really sounds very general and common sense, but the primary cause of all illnesses is imbalance of some kind, right? So there's too much or too little of proper food, proper sleep, regular rhythms of your life, you know, are you, are you just kind of doing really active for a little bit, then you slow down, and you're really active again, and the body doesn't respond well to these big sh changes. Um, so regularity is really important, um, and it's not like it's a black and white thing. It's totally an individual thing, according to your personal constitution, where you are in, in the life cycle, male, female, all these things kind of determine what's appropriate for the individual, which is why it's very helpful um, to know your constitution, to see a <coughs> practitioner who can help you, because it's hard to see oneself. You, of course you can know certain things, oh, I know every time I eat this, this happens, or, you know, I need this much sleep typically. But in general, it's hard to know, like, the, the um, intricacies of your own constitution. It's just hard to, it's even hard for me to see myself. I have to go see somebody else for a lot of things, you know. Um, but once you know your constitution, you can really kind of live a little bit more in harmony with that and know, okay, this is going to be the hard time of year for me because, you know, this is my constitution, this season is, is like kind of stirs up heat, you know, and this is something I'm sensitive to and so I should definitely avoid all these heat producing types of things. So in a real general sense, that is the cause of all illness is imbalance. So either, you know, kind of aggravating our constitution. Um, Could you just in a nutshell, describe what you mean by constitution. Yeah, it's like your tendencies. Uh, is another word to say it. Like you tend to be cold. You tend to be um, like you know people tend to get sick in the same way. A lot of times, you know. Like, oh, if I'm getting a cold, I'll, a cold, I always get a sore throat first. Or so, and the constitution, like so, for instance, in Ayurvedic medicine, they would say. 
use these words, maybe you've heard vata, pitta, kapha. Those are the what are called the, the do doshas in Ayurvedic medicine. There are dosha actually means fault or the way that we tend to go out of balance. So it's fault. Fault. Okay. Yeah. That's like the translation of the word dosha. So um, if you're a vata dosha in Ayurvedic medicine, that is related to the wind. So you're, all the constitutional things that, that affect you are typically wind imbalances. Um, so we'll talk more a little bit about that in a bit. So, because we're not really focusing on Ayurveda tonight. <laughs> Another class. Another class. So in general, trying to have moderation, uh, regularity, trying to uh, include all the tastes and flavors in your diet, not just having one or two, and we'll definitely we'll talk about that tonight, the different five or six different flavors of the diet and what they help with, what types of conditions they treat. Um, so, but trying to get a balance of tastes and temperatures of foods, quantity and timing. So in a way that all sounds common sense, but they're things that we might kind of just forget about or let s slip through the cracks. And um, if we're getting too far off on all of those things over time, it can really disrupt our, our chi, our energy, our vitality. Um, so in order to determine the pattern and then seek out what the cause of that pattern is, our, the primary diagnostic methods, I'll just mention them, we're not going to go into them, but um, are feeling the pulse, looking at the tongue, asking a whole lot of questions. Um, possibly palpating the body, we might palpate the abdomen. Um, if there's pain involved, we maybe palpate that part of the body. Listening, listening to the quality of the voice, looking at the skin, the eyes, um, all of these things that tell you a lot about what is your constitution. So it's not just one thing, oh, I get cold easily. It's a multitude of things that really determine, that stack up to determine, oh, you're really more this in combination with this. and. Um, so those are the primary diagnostic methods. And um, I'm just going to write this on the board too. Once we're gathering all this information, we use what are called the eight principles, which are the, it's the first step basically. Before we get to the causes, this is the first thing we can do with all the information that we're gathering by, by working with a patient. Um, the eight principles are yin and yang. Um, deficiency and excess. Hot and cold. And exterior, interior. So, you're probably familiar with all these. We just talked about them. That these are the eight th eight primary things that, again, if we're totally lost on what's going on, we can start to navigate by going back to these eight principles. Is it more yin and yang, yin or yang in nature? Is it more? Is there too much of something, or is there too little of something? Is it hot natured? Is it cold natured? To determine hot and cold, um, in some ways it's really straightforward. In other ways, it's not. But for one thing, if it responds well to cold, it's probably a heat condition, and vice versa is to bring balance, um, but also looking at the tongue and feeling the pulse are huge indicators of hot or cold. Easy one is if it's a rapid pulse, it indicates heat. If it's slow, it indicates cold. Um, another easy one on the tongue, if there's a lot of redness, that indicates heat. If it's more white or pale, more cold. And then exterior, interior, that's just, again, looking what level of the body is affected. Is it more on the deep level or more at the surface? So this, immediately we can start to place things really a little more easily. Um, and it can get a whole lot more complicated from here. But we can always come back to this if it's too complicated. So eight principles. And probably even of those, the hot, cold, and excess deficiency are the most clinically significant. Yin and yang um, is more of like a broad picture. You know, that's why we started with that. It's the more like, it's the big picture. This, these help us to kind of hone in a little more so we can get more specific. So deficiency excess on hot and cold. All right, so let's get into the causes now. Any questions? Okay. 
clear the top end. So in Chinese medicine, we, there's three categories of causes. Um, I'm gonna, I keep wanting to say exogenous, which is, we can use that word, but we'll use external. Internal. Neutral. Sorry, I hope you can see that. It will start to dry. <laughs> but external, internal, and neutral, or this also just means non external or non internal. The external causes relate to what are called the six climates. Um, also included in this external category are what are called the, the pestilences, which is like an old word. I think it, I mean, it, to me that word is, is like a biblical word, pestilence. But um, it refers to in, like infectious diseases, contagious diseases fall into this category. Basically the idea with this, and we're going to go into more detail with it, but it's just that there's, they're external and that they're, they're not internally generated. We can expose ourselves to a particular climate, and that can actually, what they say is invade the body. The climate can invade the body. And, um, yeah. So I'll just outline these, and then we'll go into them. And then internal, in Chinese medicine, these are the um, five major emotions. Which we'll go into, too. And then basically neutral includes everything else, diet, sleep, sexual activity, work habits, everything else that could possibly go into that category, parasites, trauma, um, yeah. So let's see. Yeah, recent additions to this last category are things like pollution, radiation, um, chemicals and food. So those are also causes of disease. All right. So if there aren't any questions, we can jump into the external first and go over those. All right. All right, so the six climates are wind, Cold, um, fire, dampness, something called summer heat, and dryness. So these climates, basically, it's good to, again, relate it to your constitution. Um, these only become causes of illness if in relationship to the individual. So, for instance, if someone has a tendency towards heat, and maybe they're they're like kind of feeling a little worn down, they're already a little bit hot, and then they get exposed to this hot climate in Arizona or something. That's when it's going. The climate then is what causes them to have an imbalance. You know, at that point. It's always a, a relationship between the strength of the person and the, the, this external factor. So it's not that one is inherently um, like weak or fundamentally weak. It's just in relationship. So does that make sense? All right. So typically these first wind, fire, summer heat, and dryness are all considered yang. So remember how we were defining yin and yang? Does that make sense? That those would fall under that category. More heat, light, insubstantial, not as dense. So wind, fire, summer heat, and dryness. Whereas cold and dampness are yin pathogens. So, so let's just go into each of these a little bit.
Oh, one other thing I'll say in general, just about all of these, is that all of these typically enter the body through the respiratory system or through the skin. So a lot of like, uh, in Western terms, bacterial, viral uh, illnesses would fall into this category of external causes. Um, the interesting thing is just this differentiation process that happens in Chinese medicine is really really hones in on something. So rather than giving antibiotics for everything, which is a really cold, a really cold substance. So they're very effective when there's extreme heat. But if it's a cold illness, which so that, that distinction's not made in Western medicine, it's one, not going to help, and it probably could make it worse. Um, and it won't address these other symptoms. In fact, a lot of times, if it's these combined together, it's very common for them to combine. So like damp heat can, can be together. Or that can generate in the body once it's, it's penetrated the body. So, and it can change. Cold can enter first, and it can transform into heat. And then if the heat doesn't get cleared, dampness can accumulate. So, but the point I was going to make about antibiotics is that they are really just primarily very cold. And so what can often happen is if it is a heat condition, but it has dampness, it can treat, they treat the heat, but it doesn't address the dampness. And so common that you see um, after antibiotics, people have this lingering mucus, dampness, in the ears, in the throat, and yeah, they're clearing, they, that just didn't get addressed. It's a very common thing. And anyway, there's a lot to say about antibiotics. Overuse, you know, really overuse, so that a lot of times, too, if they're inappropriately used, um, they end up, one, not treating the illness, and then maybe there's a pause where there's a break, but it comes back and it's even stronger. Um, Chinese medicine really shines in this category. It really can treat many of the illnesses that someone would seek out antibiotics for and not have to take them. And it also can save the day um, when someone has been taking antibiotics and they have these what we call lingering pathogens in the body. There's this whole class of medicinals that are used for that to get to this, this aspect of the body where illnesses can kind of linger. They're like not on the inside all the way and they're not on the outside all the way. They're in the middle. And so there's these really great herbs that can really get to that level of the body. And well, it depends on what kind of pathogen it is, whether it needs to be drained out, cleared out, whether it needs to transform. Um, so there's different things that you do with the different pathogens, and that's very complicated to talk about. But um, So let's, any questions about that? Though? Well, I just think it's sad that the, um, the FDA hasn't regulated herbs, so I think people are more leery of taking them, not mm. themselves. Yeah, some people are. Yeah. It's changing, though, I think. All right, so let's talk about each of these a little bit. All right, so wind. Uh, in general, wind, just like it is in nature, it looks in the body, it moves around, it comes quickly, it can go quickly. So when you have any kind of condition that acts like that, it's typically considered a wind condition. Um, tremors, shaking, um, dizziness, pain that moves around, it's here, then it's there. Itching is associated with wind. So those are all considered wind conditions. Most typically wind affects the upper body, but not always. Like, like I said, with joints, you can definitely have wind, what's called a wind, often combined with dampness or hot or cold in a joint. So like a, a knee, for instance, that's swollen and hot, um, that comes and goes, would be a wind, damp, heat condition in the knee. So. Swollen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's all those things I just was, was mentioning are what are called in e external wind. There's something called internal wind too. So that that means that the wind can be generated from within one's own body, and you don't have to go be exposed to the climate of wind to have it caused. So a lot of times when you see extreme um, high fevers, convulsions. Um, certain dizziness symptoms, those can be internally generated. They don't have to be from being exposed to the wind. But it's good to be, like, for instance, if you're at, like, the Vata constitution, which I mentioned is wind in Ayurveda, um, 
but you can be predisposed to wind affecting you. So for some people, it's strongly discouraged from going out in the wind, and that by doing that, you can get you can get sick. You know, so that's why they often talk in China. You'll never see in the winter time or fall or winter, basically until spring, anyone without a scarf protecting this part of the head. This is what's called the wind gate, the occiput and the neck. And so the scarf really protects a lot from one of the primary entrances of the wind can come in that way. Of course, it can come through the nose, mouth, too, ears, any of the openings we have in our bodies. Um, but definitely the neck is an area. So that's a little bit about wind. Um, cold. I'll just, I'm going to keep moving because make sure we have enough time for everything. <laughs> cold. Um, is associated with, of course, low temperature, things kind of decelerating in activity, congealing in the body. You see, like I mentioned, slow pulse, white tongue or pale tongue, pale face, pale, pale nail beds, wanting warmth, so warmth feels good. These are all ways you can know it's probably a cold condition. If there's any kind of mucus, it's going to be clear, thin, Copious. Uh, in terms of urination, it's going to be long voidings, clear. Um, could be a little bit cloudy, but usually just clear. Um, and if it's a cold type of pain, it's going to feel really severe and fixed. Um, whereas the wind was moving around, the cold is like ice. It contracts and it is fixed and strong. So people will describe that pain as being severe and stagnant. Contracted. The pain scale is stupid. Really <laughs> it is. I'm a nurse. It's like, really? You're Italian. <laughs> Ridiculous. So that's cold. So then on the other side, heat. Heat or anything where there's signs of heat, like hot to touch, high fever, um, if there's an aversion to being hot, wanting cold, redness anywhere, eyes, face tongue, pulse is rapid, anytime you see any yellow, like yellow tongue coating, yellow mucus, that's all signs of heat. So when you have like thick mucus from the nose, you're coughing up thick yellow mucus. So we're on fire, right? Yeah, we're, yeah. I think I said heat, but fire, yeah. heat, sorry. Um, I use them interchangeably, but um, so anytime you see that thick yellow mucus anywhere in the body, that's heat. Anytime there's a strong foul smell, that's heat. So in the stools, anything like that, definitely heat. So typically dry, hard stools are associated with heat. Uh, any kind of bleeding, abnormal bleeding, eruptions, skin, like pustules. Also anytime there's like manic, in the manic behavior, that's usually related to heat. All right, uh, dampness. This one is really looks like, again, so this is an accumulation of pathogenic fluid. So we don't want, you know, fluid itself isn't bad, but dampness is where it's fluids accumulating. So this can come, you know, you can be exposed to dampness by living in a really damp, humid place, living in a basement or something, um, wearing wet clothes for too long or something like that. Uh, basically anything that's like clammy, viscous, like if you touch someone's skin, it's really wet. Uh, characterized by heaviness, heavy sensations of any kind, heavy headedness, heavy joints, swelling, fatigue. Joints with dampness are like swollen or they also just feel like they're inhibited, like they're not fully, there's not a, there's like a fullness and an in, yeah, in, inhibited movement. Uh, in terms of digestion, dampness can definitely be involved in the digestive system. This looks like diarrhea more, um, kind of like gas and bloating is usually associated with damp dampness, stools that are not formed. The pulse is going to be what's called soggy. <laughs> so any kind of edema or, or water swelling in the legs, all of this is dampness. Vaginal discharge, weeping sores. 
Then the summer heat, you don't see it too often. It's just the, in Chinese medicine, they categorize it separately. It's this type of heat that only comes in the late summer where it's kind of a mixture of dampness and heat. And uh, it's characterized by an absence of sweating, actually. So it's like the, the heat is tra trapped by the dampness. Uh, whereas in a, a fire condition, you'll see sweating. It will be, it'll be hot. The pulse is going to be more just like surging rather than just rapid. It's going to be really strong in the summer heat. Typically, people have like they're short of breath. If you're really hot, like almost like they're going to pass out. Um, so I, you may have either experienced that or heard about people having this around that like late summertime where we have more hot, humid. It doesn't happen, I don't think, as much in this climate actually. But sometimes um, there's a nausea and vomiting, kind of just like oh, feeling sick or diarrhea. So anyway, this is it's kind of like heat stroke, yeah. So. It happens some, but it's not, a, you know, I don't see it that much. But they do classify it separately, and there are specific herbs to treat that, that, those types of conditions. And then dryness is the last one. So, you know, anytime we're exposed to dry weather and dry regions, um, things like nosebleeds, dry mouth, any dry skin, dry orifices anywhere is dryness. If you have a cough with no phlegm, those are all dryness symptoms. And that's really related to uh, deficiency of the yin. So remember, yin is related to the fluid or wetness, wet aspect of the body. So dryness is a lack of yin. All right. So, and we're going to go into, basically we're going to cover all the causes first, and then we're going to go into the treatments at, afterwards. So that's, that covers the external causes. And we can go into the internal causes now. Sound good? Okay. I always had trouble spelling that. Yeah. It's like, really? <laughs> Seriously. Where's that G? Yeah, where's the G? I was just going to say that. <laughs> okay, so the internal causes are what I mentioned before, the five primary emotions. So, let's just list them here. Um, joy, they say, or I'm going to also put elation, because that's maybe a little easier to understand how it can be a cause. Anger. Sorry, this board. I'd really like to get a white Board. Yeah. The eraser board. Yeah. Well, I'll yeah. top pan. Just yeah. Suggestion. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I know. They're really bad smells. They have a bad smell. Is that what you said? Yeah. The oh. markers are just. I wonder if there's uh, any kind you can get that, that doesn't. Yeah. There Sadness. Some, yeah, there has to be some green. Sadness, worry, and fear. There had been. They had talked about seven emotions, but they ended up kind of just doing the five because the other two were really related, like um, fright was one that was separate, and shock. But these all are really similar to fear, actually. And sometimes for worry, they'll say pensiveness. Sadness, of course, greed, similar. So, you might be wondering about how these could be causes of illness. Uh, de definitely in Chinese medicine, the body and the mind are like totally related. You could, you know, in Western A and P, like growing up, I mean, they t sort of talk about the mind and the emotions as being this separate thing for sure. And also, it's almost like a body mind pyramid. You know, where the the mind and the emotions are not as important, they're de-emphasized, whereas in Chinese medicine they're totally integrated and very important, and so that they have their whole, you know, this whole category devoted s strictly to the emotions. Um, and the reason they become causes of illness is not, again, that there's, that there is an inherent problem with any of the emotions at all, actually. It's really just if any of them are 
over-expressed, under-expressed, or repressed. Um, and again, if, it, if it's too much, like it can be one explosion of one that could become a cause, or over time, which is more common, but they both happen for sure. Um, so on their own, they're definitely fine and healthy and expressed appropriately and all of that. So there's not, it's not to say any of them are inherently good or bad or anything like that. Um, so basically, I'll just talk a little bit about what happens, like kind of the, the, the effect of the emotion on the body and how they become a cause. So ang or I have these out of order, but so starting with anger, uh, anger is associated with really like kind of erratic movement. Um, each of these is associated too with um, seasons and times of year. So this is associated more with the springtime anger and the liver organ. It affects the liver organ. Um, so it's erratic, like the wind in spring and it causes the chi to flow upward. So if you have prolonged anger, chi flowing up, 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 you can see how that could cause, cause illnesses. So you get things like migraines, ulcers, which are um, you know, extreme heat in the, in the digestive tract. A lot of the reason that ulcers uh, arise in Chinese medicine they talk about is this rebellious stomach chi. <laughs> so the energy of the stomach is meant to go down, and when it when it goes up, it's rebellious, and ulcers are related to that. So it's going up with heat, again and again and again, and you get this heat kind of blazing in on these really tender mucous membranes in the GI tract. So migraines, um, ulcers, are common, commonly related with anger. So that causes the chi to rise. Um, this, so then joy and elation, people often think, well, what's wrong with that? You know, p Basically, joy and elation are related, it's more like the elation, it's an extreme, extreme um, kind of giddiness almost, or like, you know, maybe you know people who laugh at inappropriate times, or just kind of like, and that tend to burn the candle at both ends, they're just kind of like going, 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 they tend to burn out. Um, this type of person talks a lot, usually, uh, and it's related to summertime. So getting like that outward expression of summertime where everyone's kind of like more outward. That's a very young time of year. So it's related with heat and causes the chi to scatter. So that's how it can become a cause of disease is it scatters the chi. Then uh, sadness basically causes the the chi to weaken over time. With if sadness and grief just continue, continue, it just weakens over time. Um, typically this looks, it's the, a, a kind of a downward inward movement. So we didn't talk much about the seasonal movements of energy, but um, this whole kind of inward and outward movement of energy happens in the seasons, it happens in our body. So like in the winter time, this is the, when our energy is most inward. In the, in the autumn time, it's moving inward. The grief and sadness are related to that autumn time. So it's this downward and inward movement. It's not all the way in yet, but it's contracting inward. So grief tends to cause that. It's a response that causes us to kind of pull in, insulate a little bit, detach a little bit. Um, so that's grief and sadness. Um, physically, that you can you see symptoms of like shortness of breath, asthma, constipation, and worry and pensiveness. Basically, this means overthinking, thinking too much. Um, this tends to stagnate the chi. So, basically, that makes sense, right? Just kind of sitting, thinking, it's not going anywhere. It's just sitting there and thinking and going over and over and over and over and over again. It's not moving, so it stagnates. So this definitely can lead to poor digestion, um, weight gain, because it's not moving. So all of these have th the different types of movements. Acupuncture is, you know, we direct the chi specifically, and you know, to treat all of these things. Like the, the way I'm talking about it, stagnating it, we can move the chi, or we can strengthen the weak chi, or, you know, clear the heat, 
or gather the scattered qi. So all of those things, definitely acupuncture is a huge method of treatment, of course, in Chinese medicine, but herbs and foods as well. So we will talk about some of those things. Uh, and then fear. Fear is more, yeah, so that's, fear is the most inward. So talking about like the winter time where everything's all the way in, fear is associated with that like deep inward movement. This, especially you can think about in shock or something where everything just kind of goes, right? Like if we had a tur if we were a turtle, we would just totally go inside, you know. So that's what the energy does. It goes down. It descends and goes in. Um, so fear over time, you can start to see physical symptoms like arthritis cold symptoms, you know, that deep contraction, you know, the, it's just the body's not circulating, she's not circulating well, so cold symptoms arise. Deafness is associated with fear over time. Six o'clock. How long are we going? We're going to 6.30 tonight? Five to 6.30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's for the in, internal causes. We'll keep going. All right. So then when we get to that last category, which is a pretty big category, if you think about everything else, um, but it's neither internal or external per se, but probably the biggest one in this category is diet. Um, but we can put in sex, um, just activity level, trauma, parasites and poisons, wrong treatment, which has a very fancy word, iatrogenesis, which you probably know being a nurse. What was that again? Iatrogenesis. No, actually. Yeah, this is what wrong treatment means. Maybe Basically, you take the wrong nurses. medicine, you know, that can be a cause of <coughs> illness. Oh, and probably even actually before diet is constitution. But diet's a huge one. I mean, all of these actually are really big if we're doing them a lot, you know. So again, we're just talking about moderation here. So anything where we're in extremes in any of these categories it can definitely be a cause of illness. So too much sex, too little sex, if, you know, a lot of that is, that's a big topic, of course, but if it's repressed if some, in some way, that can become a cause. Activity level is huge, you know, just working, 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 which is a huge one in our society now. <coughs> Overworked, not, that's just not balanced in rest and activity. But on the other side, you could be the type of person who, for your job, you're just sitting, 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 and so, you know, that's not enough activity. And, you know, they do talk about mental activity versus physical, physical activity, so they're both important, you know, to, to consider. Um, trauma, injuries, parasites, poisons. But, so, diet, the biggest thing that they talk a lot about in both Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine is, over, of course, processed foods are to be avoided. So eating too many processed foods, packaged foods with many ingredients, not good for, for your health. But other things are um, overconsumption of cold, raw foods, which for some constitutional types in certain times of the year can be really good. But for a lot of people, um, definitely this time of the year, most everybody should be eating more cooked foods <coughs> in general. And unless you're like way overweight in extreme heat, excess yang type, then I would recommend not having too many raw foods. In the summer, most people, because, you know, it's naturally warm and we can get away with having more raw foods and cooling foods, um, but even still, if you're like more of a cold type person and or you're really weak or your digestion's not really kind of up to snuff, having a lot of raw, cook, raw foods, cooling foods are going to be really taxing on the system. You can think about the digestive system like this big pot, big cauldron your belly and to get things it's like a cooking pot we want things to be warm so they can move and get break down and be assimilated 
the raw food has to be first, your body has to turn up the heat to even get it to digest first. So of course, chewing your food really well is one big step for that process. So re chewing well, a lot of saliva has enzymes in it to naturally start to, to break down process, but um, if you just kind of inundate that pot with all this cold food, it has got a lot of work to do. So trying to not to have too much. So you'll never see in like in Asian countries, no one will drink icy beverages, no ice, always room temperature or warm. Because again, it's the, the stomach does not respond well to the cold. So we're just about ready here to talk about um, some just foods and herbs and how we, how we can use those to treat these internal external causes. I did want to just talk just for a minute about Ayurvedic take on a couple things that are a little bit, a little bit different. It's really related, but um, they talk, I'm going to go ahead and clear this. I hope I'm not going too fast for y'all. I'm just trying to cover a lot. Okay. Do interrupt me if, if there's any questions. All right. So similarly, in Ayurveda, they talk about, um, they use the words exogenous, which is similar to the external idea as causes, endogenous, um, and then mental is its own category. So the exogenous is similar, it's attack, something attacks from the outside, endogenous is more of a breakdown from within the own, your own body, and then the mental is its own category. And then I mentioned these doshas, or faults, there's three of them, and really interesting, vata, pitta, kapha, and we're not going to go into it too, too much, but these are three prime, three really big um, ways, these are constitutional types, um, that the body can go out of balance. And vata is associated with wind, pitta with fire, and kapha with water. So if you, if someone, an Ayurvedic doctor for instance will say, oh you're a vata, you're a vata type with a secondary pitta. And so you really need to be most cautious with wind, being exposed to the wind, and times of the year. So the wind is most predominant during, um, and all of these are more, all of these are more predominant during junctions of seasons. So they talk about it rather than, we're in China, Chinese medicine, they say summer, winter, spring, fall, like we do. They talk more about the junctions of the, of the seasons. So like vata is more predominant during the summer fall junction. So vata people need to be careful at that time and do a lot of things like to pre prevent the wind from getting in, a lot of oil baths and a lot of water covering up, staying cool and quiet. Um, vata tends to be erratic like the wind so their chi can just leave them easily. So they need to kind of settle. So you want to settle the wind, kind of heavier foods, heavier medicinals are actually good for vata types. Like dairy is actually good for them because it's heavy in nature, oils, fats. Pitta. Pitta is most um, predominant during the spring-summer junction. So fire. Once the heat's starting to rise, the pitta starts to get active. So pitta people, heat-predominant people, need to be really careful not to get overheated, not to be out in the sun too much, have more cooling foods. And then kapha is most predominant in the winter-spring. Kapha, water types tend to be more moist, have more dampness things. They, they typically have more mucus, more phlegm. Um, they tend to have larger body frames, like kind of a little more fleshy. Um, so Vata Pitta Kapha. So they talk about these time. Time is a big cause in Ayurvedic medicine, not just your constitution, but it's a significant factor is the time of year, the time of day. Um, the time of the month, particularly for, for women who have menstrual cycles, what time of the month is it? Is it the first week, second week, third week? They definitely talk about that in Chinese medicine too. But. Um, and a big factor that Ayurvedic medicine 
emphasizes is what they call transgression against wisdom. This means, <laughs> this is the weakness of one's own inner knowledge. There's the, they talk about that everyone has this inherent sense of what's really like appropriate for them. And when we try to go against that, for instance, or if we try to rearrange the world in a way that's totally in, you know, impossible to do, that can be a cause of illness. So it's a transgression against wisdom because we know better, but we do it anyway. <laughs> so like my eighty three year old mother was stubborn. Yeah. She thinks a pill fixes everything. Yeah. Western medicine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so these are things like, oh, we know, we know having a third glass of wine isn't going to be good, but we do it anyway. Or we know coffee's not good for us, but we do it anyway. Or anything like that. If we know that, it's like we already know, but we still do it. So they could call, talk about that as a cause. Um, another, just one more thing about Ayurvedic. These are just some interesting points I thought to share with you all. Um, that all diseases in, in Ayurvedic medicine are typically due to either what they call undernourishment, or overnourishment. Sometimes they say undernourishment is like drying out and overnourishment is like too much wetness. So it's kind of interesting. They, they, the digestive system is huge in Ayurvedic medicine. They talk about that pot, that cauldron in the, in the belly and so many causes of illness are with, have to do with that not functioning properly. Um, and so we don't want to have too much wetness or like too much sweet, heavy, rich foods that put out the digestive fire, this fire under our cauldron, um, but we also don't want to dry it out because then it's just fizzling, there's nothing, you know, so both actually undernourishment and overnourishment kind of mess up the digestive <coughs> fire and they talk about mental digestive fire, so it's not only just our physical capacity to digest food, but our mental ability to digest information and make sense of things. There's a, so. there's a second brain within your digestive system, really. Yeah, I really think there's a lot of truth to that. There's more nerve endings in the GI in the stomach than there are anywhere else in the body. When they say, oh, I have a gut feeling about something, there's a real, there's truth to that. Well, you know. the gut send all this stomach to the brain, right? I don't know. Oh. Yeah. Sleeping <laughs> It was a seminar. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so that's all I wanted to say about Ayurvedic medicine's take on things. But Alright, so let's talk a little bit about diet now. And basically this whole section will just talk about foods and supplements to address these external and internal causes. So in general, um, just to say... All foods and herbs work based on certain, for certain reasons. It's not just that they happen to work or we like it. It's just this big mystery, oh, I heard that licorice does this, so it does that. You know, it's not really like that. It's very scientific, actually. And so I'm just going to tell you, write a couple of the, the properties of herbs and foods that determine why they do what they do. Um, I'm changing colors here. The thermal property of food or an herb. Um, the direction of the movement in the body. Taste, the flavor. Um, yeah, that's all we're going to talk about now. There's, there's more, like we could talk about um, which organs they en enter the body, whether they tonify, cool, moisten, warm, dry, all those kinds of things. But these are the big ones. So basically, is it a cold or a warm-natured substance? Or is it neutral? So that's pretty straightforward, right? We have this range of, in the, in the herbal medicine realm, we talk about if, is it cold, is it cool, is it neutral, is it warm, or is it hot? That's the range, typically. And foods, same thing. They really fall in the same category. Direction of movement is basically, does the herb or food cause the, what does it cause the chi to do? Does it cause it to descend? Does it cause to go up? Does it cause to go out? Primarily those are the three movements, up, down, or out. Um, so plants and foods definitely all have, have these, these ways they affect us. I taught a class on the, 
on this and, and the tastes once, and it was really fun. I'm sure I'll do it again sometime, but where we were tasting flavors and seeing, because you can feel. You I know, think I was there. You might have been there. That was a pretty big class. It was really fun. But you just, you can tell, if you have a pure flavor, just like a sour flavored something, you know, you can see how does that affect your body, you know, and why, it's a, why is it doing what it does. And then tastes and flavors. So um, I will, maybe I will just list these off for you here. Um, acrid or pungent is, is one. Sweet. Sour. Bitter. I thought you were acid. Oh, acrid, yeah. yeah. Or spicy, they say sometimes. And salty. So those are the five primary flavors. Uh, again, Ayurvedic medicine adds a, a sixth, which is astringent, which this kind of gets put into the sour category in Chinese medicine, but they do differentiate that in, in Ayurvedic medicine. So, um, gosh, we need to kind of finish up kind of soon, because then we're, we can do the, the tour more. Maybe we'll do the tour real quickly. I'll just point out a few things. And so, does that sound okay? So we can finish. Um, I'm just going to say a few things about these flavors so you can get a sense of how they move in the body. Acrid or pungent is like a spiciness, so this releases the exterior. So when we're talking about all those climates. Um, that are more on the superficial level of the body, typically at least when they en first enter, this flavor, the spicy flavor, helps to open the exterior and, and get them out of the body. So it's, they disperse outward. Um, things like cinnamon, mint, orange peel, those are examples of herbs that do that. Um, and you want to always be careful, that, you know, in Chinese medicine we would always um, discriminate between a hot spicy or cool spicy. So things like mint is a cool spicy, right? But cinnamon, ginger, those are hot. So you want to always know what you're treating before you pick one. Then sweet typically is a really important flavor. It's very helpful for strengthening and building the body. So recovering from weakness, we're very depleted. All the sweet herbs and foods like healthy sweets, you know, are really Dark good. Chocolate. Yeah, that's a little more bitter actually than uh, sweet. It's a bitter sweet, but there's a little percentage. Yeah. Um, but I would call dark chocolate a little more bitter. Whereas things like dates are a medicinal that's used a lot in Chinese medicine and it's considered sweet and very good for building the qi. So strengthening. If there's a lot of fatigue, weakness, the sweet flavor helps. The sour flavor, um, it what, does what's called stabilizes and binds, it pulls things in, so good for things like di diarrhea, sweating abnormally, anytime we're losing fluids and we're trying to pull them in, sour flavor helps to do that. Um, Example. Yeah, well, sour plum and shizandra berry are two herbs that, in, like in, in China we would just you found them at the grocery store, but I don't. I, th I think actually you can get shizander berry here, um, peony, but food-wise, like lemon, you know, is a classic sour food. And then the bitter flavor is really clearing for heat. It it drains. It's very descending. This flavor is very much missing in the Western diet, but probably about seventy percent of the medicinals are bitter, so they're really clearing. Um, and so again, a lot of these can combine, or you know, there can be a, a bitter, cold herb that enters the liver, you know, so it gets very specific with, the, with herbal medicine, and that's why they do what they do, is this combination of, of these properties, movements, and flavors. So, you know, not, you don't want to just take anything that's bitter if you're trying to clear, you want to be as specific as you can, which is why herbs can be so precise. But anytime we have too much dampness or accumulation of heat or damp, bitter is going to be really a helpful flavor. Uh, yeah, there's just so many herbs, but they're not really like super common ones here. Gardenia, coptis, I mean, 
coptis is used in Western herbal medicine a lot too. Um, they tend to be drying, bitter can be drying, so you don't want to have it like too, too, too much because you'll dry out. So you need to be careful if there's dryness symptoms. And then the salty flavor is softening. So anytime there's like a, a hardness of an accumulation that's hard, so used a lot in stone, like gallstones, kidney stones, goiter, anytime there's nodules of any kind, the salty flavor helps to break that up, soften it and break it up. And it's kind of purging too. You might have heard about like drinking salt water can purge that way. So 